this week is uh, is Earth Week, and um, Dharma teachers all over the country are asked to talk about about the Earth and about our relationship to it. And as I've reflected on the topic, it's it's very clear to me that how the external world is a mirror of our internal world. And I'd like to, to talk a little bit about, about that, that transformative process, and particularly in light of, the, of all the challenges that are going on, on on the planet and the stress that each one of us is feeling. I saw a, a little video and I got the script for it because I, I found it so uh, so moving. It seemed like such a powerful metaphor. You may have seen this. It's sort of titled how the wolves in Yellowstone change the rivers. It's a very, very cool thing. They, the wolves had were killed and eliminated from Yellowstone for, I think, 35 years. And then after a lot of haggling, uh, they were reintroduced. And what had happened was with the, with the wolves gone, there was terrible problems of overgrazing, of erosion, and so forth. So here's, here's what the script of this video um, says, and I'll send you the link in the email. It talks about how, when the wolves were brought back. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, the deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, and particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to eat the trees. And the dams they built in the rivers provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes, and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it really gets interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers narrowed, more pools formed, more ripple sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. So he goes on to say, um, when you look at it and when you think about it for a minute, here are wolves who are changing the physical geography of Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land. And you begin to see that the natural world is even more fascinating and complex than we thought it was. They tell us that when you take one thing away, you are left with a radically different ecosystem, which makes a powerful case for the reintroduction of missing species. That just struck me as so cool, that we banished one particular animal and the ecosystem came out of balance. And as I reflected on that, each one of us banishes certain parts of ourselves. And that affects our own internal ecosystem. And part of the practice of mindfulness of meditation is about recalling those places that we vanished and subsequently finding that internal balance once again, the, the true natural place of presence. So the question is, how, how do we restore balance? internally and externally. Inevitably, as I like to joke, every Dharma talk is the same talk. You, you have, you'll notice that. And every talk really draws on the four fundamental foundations 
that make up Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist psychology. The fact that when you come into form, there is suffering or stress or dissatisfaction, unsatisfactoriness is part of the human condition. The second point being there's a cause for suffering and stress. The third of the teachings about the cessation of suffering and stress. And the fourth is about the path, the technologies that lead to the release of suffering and stress. So suffering happens. And again, many different interpretations of the word, of this word suffering or dukkha. And one of the analogies I found very, very helpful, the word is dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A. And what's very interesting is how the, um, in the early, early, the, in the early language, the, the Aryans, the word dukkha refers to uh, the, the hole in a wheel where the axle is. So when, when the hole is in the axle perfectly, then the wheel turns evenly. If, if, the, if the axle hole is a little bit off center, the whole wheel, you know, is wobbly. So it's, it's the metaphor of finding that place of center balance. When you're off balance, when you're afflicted with greed or hatred or confusion, it pulls the center of the axle off. So your whole life gets very uncomfortable and wobbly. So we have suffering in the world. We have suffering in our lives. It's a fact. And as I was reflecting on seeing suffering in the world, I remember I had one experience that was, it was quite stunning for me. Uh, I lived in West Africa for almost three years. I was in the Peace Corps. And uh, one of the more moronic things I've done in my life was attempting to be the the first American to cross the Sahara Desert on a bicycle. <clears throat> you might notice the operative word there is tried. <clears throat> I met someone who did it from the north and I spent about two years preparing myself for it. And, and I was in good shape, but the hot season came early, the harmattan winds, these dust-laden winds were really oppressive and I didn't get too far before I, I, I got sick. But I trained a lot. I rode my bike a lot and through, you know, through little villages and, and along the Niger River. At one point I was biking uh, in the, the capital city of Niger. It's the capital. The capital of Niger is, is Niamey. And I, I just stopped my bike just, you know, somewhere. And I looked up and as far as I could see, it was kids. From, from toddlers to, to young teenagers. And I realized there was no way all these people were gonna survive. Uh, the, the land of Niger has a growing season of 90 days. So you grow your millet, you know, for 90 days and then you wait for the next, for the next rainy season. It simply cannot sustain life. And there's a very powerful book I'd call called Ishmael, which is the, a very powerful exploration of, of how nature works. That when you, have over, when you have too many rabbits and you have a harsh winter, the rabbits die off, and that's, that's how life gets balanced and basically says, get used to it, it's gonna happen. But the stunning realization for me was kind of the sense of overwhelm, that this is more people than can possibly survive. How do I hold that? And I, I still wonder how I held that all those years, living in, in a place of such abject, abject poverty and with so much overpopulation. So there's tremendous suffering out there in the world. And we have different ways of dealing with it. And we have ways of just sort of covering it over, denying it, staying really, really busy, et cetera, et cetera. But part of the practice of recognizing suffering is coming out of denial about it. 
and externally, it's the recognition that this is, this is where our planet is right now. It takes courage to name what's present. It can feel discouraging, overwhelming, angering. And internally, with our own relationship with dukkha, it takes courage to name what's there. Anxiety, frustration, depression, recognizing that there's fear about your future or the recognition that a, that a relationship you're in isn't, isn't the right one. Naming it is a very, very powerful step. It takes tremendous courage to name what is so. And this is the, the path of wisdom, the distinction between your preference and your story to what's actually here. And so in that naming, we recognize what's between us and feeling free, what's between us and feeling happy. And then we can look to the cause. And this is a very integral part of the, of the Buddhist teachings. Anything in your life that you find out of balance, any complaint that you have, there is a source, there's a cause for that. And it has to do with attachment, it has to do with clinging, with the inability to let go. And the cause of suffering is directly related to what are, what are called the three poisons. The, the forces that are between you and feeling fully present are greed, hatred, and delusion or confusion. I was always struck by, um, you know, Easter Island. I, I read the book uh, Aku Aku a long, long time ago. You know, the whole mystery of how these giant, giant statues on Easter Island got there. And I, I, I thought about that because it's such an amazing story of, of uh, delusion. Um, I, I found out these, these statues, these heads are, are up to 82 tons. Th uh, the longest one is 32 feet long, and there are, and there are 80, 80, 887 of these statues all over the island. It's phenomenal. At one time, the island was heavily forested, uh, very fertile soil. Um, someone who came through said, it would, for about three days' worth of work, you could live very, very comfortably. And what happened was they started to cut down the trees. And part of it was for their, their ceremonies and so forth. But they were fishermen and they lived off the sea. And at one point, at one point, someone cut down the last tree. And I wondered, what was that person thinking? This is the last tree. <laughs> and they found in subsequent years that they had they didn't have any boats because they cut down all the trees. And, and the, the island went into ruins, basically. And heavy soil loss, the, the entire civilization collapsed. So to me, this is really kind of the force of delusion, of not, not recognizing where we are and where we're going. So these forces of greed, hatred, and delusion are, they're very powerful forces. It's how things get sold to us all the time. You see the commercial of the, of the boy who wants to go on a date, but he's got a pimple on his nose. You know, the next cut, he's using a special cream. The next cut, he's making out with a beautiful woman. It's like, there it is, that's advertising. So we see this in the world. We see the force of greed externally in the world. When I see how gas prices are kept at a point where our alternatives 
If they were a little bit cheaper, alternatives would make more sense, but they're just left at that point. Some things that are so saddening the, in, in some states where now it's illegal to photograph factory farming. You know, there's some, you know, whatever money was there to make that happen. I read later that uh, in Australia, you know, the, it's, if you want to do solar, you pay a heavy, heavy tax. Again, coming from, from industry lobbyists to, to hold down the solar, competing against the, the entrenched you know, fossil fuel industry. And of course, all the, all the confusion that's laid out there around global warming, for example, very much like cigarettes. You know, well, all the evidence isn't quite in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And whether, whether or not it's global warming, uh, I heard this one thing I thought was so helpful. Uh, the, I believe, and this might, may be mistaken, but the, that the man who sort of identified the term global warming, he said, I wish I hadn't used that word. What I really meant to say was global weirding. And that seems so much more apt because really what we're seeing are more and more wild fluctuations you know, throughout the planet. And it seems a little bit more, a little bit more accurate. So in the midst of our, of our confusion as a culture, it takes a certain discernment to, to really look closely what's actually true? What's actually going on? And how do we respond to it? It's also recognizing too that it's the, the underprivileged parts of our planet that are feeling it the most and will feel it the most. With the, the rampant flooding in certain parts of Asia uh, the low-lying islands now beginning beginning to disappear. So this seeing the force of greed and hatred and confusion externally again can be very depressing. It can also be maddening. There are all kinds of responses we have to it. But I find it helpful to remember it's a reflection of my own internal world as well. How is my for my life? influenced by my own greed, by my own aversion, and by my own confusion. Which leads to the third, the third of the, uh, the Noble Truths, which is the cessation of suffering. Where the Buddha said, anything you're holding on to, you can let go. And the, 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 the toughest teaching that I've run across is where the Buddha says, nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. It's a real mind bender to try that one. Nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. And whenever we go through a transformative process, whenever you let go of something, inevitably there is some shift in identity that allows you to let go. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I feel so fortunate in my life to be, to be teaching and supporting people in different ways in their practice. It's, a, it's an amazing privilege. And I get, to, I get to hear from people about how their lives change. And it's, it's quite stunning, truly. How many of us here feel like meditation has improved your life in some way? It's crazy, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's amazing, this practice that it's all about putting it in neutral. What happens when you pause? And, and how your life gets reoriented when you can sustain, even if for brief moments, that sense of, of, of disengaging, invoking the sense of self-observation without judgment. And amazing things come out of that space. 
And one way to think of it, and, I, and I've noticed for myself, that over, over my life of practice, I think, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure, that there has been a lessening of greed and a lessening of hatred and a lessening of confusion. Now, I may be confused and deluded about that, and I'm, <laughs> I'm the first to acknowledge that. But I, I remember the, uh, the, the second month-long retreat I went on, and I couldn't really name what happened afterward as I was sort of making my way back into life. And I realized, you know what? I'm just less anxious. My, I, my anxiety level dropped, and I can't even tell you how, how that happened. There was no specific aha that I had. And I love the story of um, Pema Chodron. Um, and she's someone, if you're not familiar with Pema Chodron, she's an amazing, exquisite teacher. Um, and she's been teaching for, I think, about 40 years or 45 years. And she was asked once, well, what got you started meditating? And she said, oh, that's easy. I hated my husband. <laughs> <laughs> but she said how this entire life of practice, she's never had a breakthrough. And she said, I get so jealous of the people who've had like the big breakthroughs and the big insights because I've never had one. But when I look back over my life, I see is a practice of gradual awakening. And I love that teaching. You know, and it just, it's very helpful when you look back over your practice, your different, different forms of practice, that you may notice that there is some quality that emerges as greed, hatred, and delusion become more quieted, or those forces have less, less grip on you. And so I really can sense and feel that in the midst of, of all the dukkha, all the world dukkha, that there's also something emerging. And again, maybe that's total delusion, but I don't think so. And I wanted to just to share a couple of random things that were sort of like popping through my mind. I was recently, this summer I was in Amsterdam. Uh, Tara and I were leading a day-long retreat. And there were times we just looked at ourselves and we just said, is this an enlightened society? Because everyone was on bikes, you know, and everyone was just so pumped on endorphins, you know, from biking everywhere. And the, uh, the, with the efficiency of the city, and we, we did a um, little canal ride, and we asked our canal uh, boat rider, whatever, is, whatever you call that, you know, how polluted the water was. And he said, well, actually, we just had a, uh, we just had a swimming contest here just a few weeks ago. I thought, here's an entire city with a network of canals, and the water is so clean you can swim in it. And I thought, what an amazing culture that has that, that quality of self-awareness. That was pretty powerful. I had read a book uh, a number of years ago. Um, it's, I imagine it's dated by now. But it's called Hope, Human and Wild. And it talked about how if you see the planet from a satellite, that there are parts of the globe that look like they're being shaved from deforestation, just just shaving, shaving the landscape. You know, and a lot of this has to do with the, the palm, palm oil production, um, beef production, and so forth. I said, but there are also parts of the globe where it looks like a mold is growing. And he talked about how. Uh, New England and the Mid-Atlantic and parts of the South where all the old farms have been abandoned, that there is, there is tree growth happening. And, and, is, and you can see it from space, that there, there are parts of the planet that are rapidly going through a reforestation process. And I also read recently that uh, the Philippines uh, just had They've applied to the Guinness Book of World Records for the most trees planted in one day. They're, they're going through a whole reforestation process. And, and, nor, and um, a West African country just, 
uh, made an agreement with Norway to do a whole reforestation uh, project that Norway is paying for it. And, uh, and having seen in my Peace Corps days, you know, the reforestation process of there, there's a tremendous amount um, happening just on that level. Also, I read how, um, how the aircraft industry is very concerned about the quality of the fuel from the, uh, from the shale oil. It doesn't really meet their requirements. And um, that there is a, they're having a, right on the verge of a breakthrough of plants that, that grow in deserts and in salt water that has amazing biomass potential. And uh, they say it's a complete game changer in terms of uh, the generation of alternative energy. I also, one of my uh, best friends uh, was uh, the head of the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a, kind of a green think tank. So uh, I got some great news from him as well. How there, there's a process of completely rethinking how, the, how cars are designed and built, like scrapping the entire design. And while it's still years out, you know, what, we'll, what we will be probably be seeing will be cars will be much lighter and very easily recyclable. Like all the parts will be able to be recycled and the carbon fiber, um, all different forms of, uh, of how they build the structures. Uh, we're gonna see some really, really interesting things. Um, there's also um, a very cool project they're involved in I'm not sure what the status of it now, but it's to take all the delivery trucks, the post office, UPS, FedEx, and electrify them all. And part of the, part of the reasoning of why they feel this is such a, a strategic leverage point in our culture is not only, not only are these you know, used a lot, but what it will do to the consciousness of everyone to see so many electric vehicles, that it'll, it'll help to create a, a shift in consciousness in terms of how we, we think of transportation. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Germany went from 6% renewable energy to 30% in the last few years. And in all of this, there, there, there are more and more stories of of what I really feel that when, when greed, hatred, and delusion are diminished, creativity arises. The sense of I and mine falls away, and suddenly there is more communication, more creativity, more possibilities emerging out of that, the consciousness that comes from cultivating non-judging presence. In that same way, when you see the forces of, of greed, of wanting, when you see the forces inside of hatred, of judgment, blame, anger, when you find yourself caught in delusion or confusion, and you can bring attention to that, your life will transform in the same way that we're perhaps beginning to see it externally as we respond to, to the crisis, we can transform on the inside. So this leads us to, to the fourth insight of the Buddha. The first one, suffering happens. There's a cause of suffering it's possible to move into the cessation of suffering. And there's a path. There are practices, there are technologies that, that lead to the release of suffering in your life. And it brings us back again to the story of reintroducing the wolves. Something was missing in that ecosystem Something had been banished. And when it was brought back, the ecosystem came back in the balance again. 
And I've been asking myself, what have I banished? <laughs> you know, wh what about my ecosystem? Because my ecosystem gets kind of dry sometimes. <laughs> There's some deforestation, et cetera, et cetera. And the reflection has been really, really helpful for me. We're always looking for balance. You know, I have so many conversations with people about the work-life balance. You know, your work life and your personal life. Like, where is the balance there? The balance of, of exertion and the balance of rest. How much time do you put out? How much time do you renew? What's the balance there? The balance of, of stimulation and internal res reflective restorative time. So for me, the, the balance, or what I've banished, I've really come to see is forgetting to pause, or remembering to pause, really. A good friend of mine talks of this analogy of how your life is made up of four quadrants. The first quadrant is all the stuff that happens that needs your immediate attention. The unexpected phone call, you know, the, the email you have to write, you know, the, the crisis with a friend. You're reacting to what happens in your life. That's the first quadrant. The second quadrant is all the stuff you said you would do. Your commitments, your plans for the day, your contracts, all the stuff you said you were going to do. The third quadrant is strategic planning. It's really asking yourself, is what I'm doing today in any way connected with where I want to be in 10 years? And it takes a certain degree of reflection. And the fourth quadrant is all about presence. It's about rest, it's about renewal, it's art, it's fun, it's adventure, it's creativity, it's everything you do that just juices you in the moment. And what happens in my life, maybe in yours, everything slides into the first quadrant. And I spend a lot of time just reacting. Have you ever had those days where you could just be responding to email all day? You know, they just keep coming in, you know? All the unexpected stuff that happens. And what I found for myself, it's just me, every minute that I spend in the fourth quadrant of renewing, of disengaging, non-judging awareness, presence, informs dramatically the other three quadrants. So for me, I really see that when I invite the wolf back into the ecosystem, for me it's about inviting back in my, my practice, making that a priority. Another analogy of that, that banishing of the wolf can also be, be seen as different parts of ourselves that we, that we banish. And inevitably, what you find in the practice of meditation is those parts want your attention. They'll be, they'll be knocking on the door, wanting to be seen and heard. And that's, again, where the transformative practice comes in. And the, the teaching analogy I use all the time, maybe too much, but it's never, I don't think it ever hurts to hear it too much, is in your practice when you're visited by one of those banished entities is the story of a, of a woman meditating in her cave, just very calmly. And she's visited by three demons. They're whirling around the cave, horrible, horrible screeching. And she gets up very quietly and she starts building a little fire. She's so non-reactive, the demons get really ticked, you know, so they amp it up a little bit. You know, again, these horrible sounds and images and really frightening stuff. And she 
very quietly, she fills a little water kettle and puts it on the, puts it over the fire. And this enrages the demons. They throw everything they've got at her. And very quietly, she's putting these little teacups out on the table. And finally, they've kind of exhausted themselves. And they say, what is going on? We are your three worst nightmares, your three deepest wounds. And here you are building a fire, putting up in this little uh, water and setting out these teacups. And she says, well, you've been here before. You'll be here again. So in the meantime, what kind of tea would you like? <laughs> and I really think that really takes us to the essence of the practice. That when you encounter these forces that are part of the human experience, any of the manifestations of greed, of wanting, of desire, any of the manifestations of aversion, anger, hatred, blame, times when you find yourself confused, those are wanting to have tea with you. In that same way, when we don't turn away from the problems of the world, but we can see them for what they are, and we can diminish the, the sense of the, the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion, creativity begins to emerge. New possibilities begin to emerge. And then the question becomes, what is your path? What will restore you to a sense of, of balance in your life? When we are struck by the issues of the world, it's very easy to react out of anger or blame. And as I've said before, when you when you act out of anger and blame, there's a certain degree of effectiveness. When you can come from a place of compassion and wisdom, there is a different degree of effectiveness in the world. So just as we see the suffering in the world, it's so helpful to see how, what a metaphor this is for our internal process as well. And there are those who, who react out of fear and close down. And through, through these practices, I have certainly found them to be an incredible formula for not just coming into contact with everything that's between you and feeling free and happy, but transforming, truly transforming your life from the inside out. Why don't we close with a, a short reflection, a short meditation. You might invite your attention back to your breath. And you might just sense this quality of presence, whatever that means for you. Or just resting attention in the here and now. As we sense the possibility of this life, what is possible in this human form? It's easy to become overwhelmed. I'd like to close with these words from Wendell Berry. It's entitled, The Real Work. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, 
we have come to our real work. And that we, when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded string, stream, I'm sorry, the impeded stream is the one that sings. And you might just sense in these moments the restoration of your own ecosystem. What would bring you into greater balance in your life? In that shared inquiry, you can deepen the breath. And when you're ready, you can let your eyes open. Thank you for your, your kind attention. A few announcements before we, uh, before we close. Um, would you like to, uh, uh, well, I'll give you the mic. So we, uh, we have an announcement here and then just a few more. Hi, I'm Donna Sacco and uh, an announcement was made last week, but just in case, um, some of you didn't hear it. I was a special education teacher in Arlington for 11 years and I'm now a PhD student at George Mason. I'm doing a pilot study. Um, where I'd like to interview parents of students with special needs who've practiced mindfulness meditation to find out more about how the practices help them parent ch uh, children with disabilities in the hopes that eventually it will lead to an intervention study for parents who don't have mindfulness practice. So I have a flyer with my email address on it. If you know of anyone who may be interested, it involves me um, interviewing someone. Um, so, see me afterwards. Thanks. Um, I'm going to be uh, teaching. I'm going to be up in New England next week, but we have someone coming who I think you'll enjoy. I'll send you some information about her. She has a new book that's just come out. So, uh, wait, we'll have a guest uh, teacher uh, next week. Also, just to let you know, I'm going to be doing a day-long retreat on the 18th of October. So I'll send you a little information about that as well. But if you're wanting some time to just to step back, immerse yourself, the, uh, the day-long is from 9.30 to 4. And uh, it's pretty intensive. We dive into some, some really cool practices. So more information on that. And Carl, if, Carl, if you can stand up so we know who you are. Carl is here, and if, you, if you're interested in a free Zabuton that's hardly used, Carl is the man to see. So you'll be out at tea uh, afterward? Great. Uh, it's a Zabuton. Oh, it's, Zabuton. it's a refrigerator. No, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a meditation uh, device. Carl will tell you all about it. Pardon? It's actually... Oh, it's in, it's in his car, so if you're interested, yeah. We've got a whole thing going on here, so Carl will fill you in. Bob. We have fresh homemade cookies. They may not last. Oh, my God. I predict a, I predict a mindful stampede for, uh, for cookies and tea. Thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, and please help yourself to tea and cookies and all those good stuff. If you want to be on the mailing list, be sure to put your name. If, if you signed up and you didn't get it, uh, sign up again, and thank you as always for your uh, your support.